everyone. Welcome back to CBS News. I'm Elaine Quijano. And I'm Lana Zak. Here's a quick look at some of the top stories we're following. Republican South Carolina Senator Tim Scott officially launched his 2024 presidential bid earlier today. He is the latest high-profile politician to join the party's growing presidential field. Florida Governor Ron DeSantis is expected to launch his campaign this week. Plus, President Biden and House Speaker Kevin McCarthy sit down for another round of discussions about the nation's debt ceiling. The two are pressing forward with negotiations just weeks ahead of the default deadline. The talks come on the heels of President Biden cutting his trip overseas short after attending the G7 summit in Japan. And a judge has entered a not guilty plea on behalf of Brian Koberger. The man is accused of stabbing four Idaho college students to death last year. Koberger remained silent during his arraignment when he was asked how he would plead to those charges earlier today. Well, the NAACP is cautioning travelers against visiting Florida. The civil rights organization alleges Florida has become increasingly hostile to black Americans under the leadership of Ron DeSantis. A spokesperson for the Republican governor is deriding the advisory as a, quote, stunt. But the NAACP claims Governor DeSantis is attempting to erase black history and restrict diversity, equity and inclusion programs in Florida schools. This comes after he blocked the introduction of an advanced placement course focusing on African-American studies in Florida high schools earlier this year. Joining us now is Derek Johnson. He's the president and CEO of the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, or the organization more commonly known as the NAACP. Derek, it's great to have you back with us. So it's worth noting that both the League of United Latin American Citizens and LGBTQ plus advocacy group Equality Florida previously issued travel advisories for Florida earlier this year. Uh, tell us what was behind the ND NAACP's decision to take this action now. Well, we began to look at the pattern and the comments, along with the public policy that Governor DeSantis and the, then the Florida legislative body began to enact. And we recognize that it is a direct attack, not only on the African-American community, but the Latino community, on women, on the LGBT plus QIA community. And that's a problem. He's using his platform as governor to try to promote otherism or racial hate and division that should not be the case. And America needs to understand as he prepared to run for the presidency, we cannot stand as a nation, another individual occupying the White House with this type of belief system. Governor DeSantis's press secretary called the travel advisory a quote, stunt. What's your response to that? But was it a stunt to block children's experience to learn uh, history holistically? Was it a stunt for him to pursue a course of action to target the LGBT community? Is it not a stunt for all the things he's doing to try to garner support from a minority of the U.S. population to win uh, the nomination to be the, the nominee for his, his political party? All of these things he are doing is, is the use of race as a tool to promote himself on a platform that's intolerant of diversity, uh, diversity intolerant of people. Everything he's done is a stunt. Derek, I want to go back to the idea of this travel advisory, because while it is focused politically on the governor, uh, it also has implications for um, people in hospitality and in, in all of the other sectors, um, including black Americans in Florida. Tell us what really went into the decision about a travel advisory and talk to us about the other instances in which the NAACP has uh, has issued a similar travel advisory. First of all, this was informed by the community that who are members in the state of Florida. This has been informed by other black institutions that we are in, aligned with. Uh, and they're saying that we have to address the problem of direct racial attacks from this governor in a way in which we don't abandon the citizens of Florida, in a way in which we don't allow it to go unaddressed. And so what came out of this was the State Conference of Florida making a decision that it was a problem and something needed to get done, that our, the members of our national board began to deliberate to determine what was the best approach. And at the end of the day, this was this struck the right balance to ensure that if individuals or organizations had to go to Florida, to work with local community groups in, within the African-American community so we can address this question, while at the exact same time, if you don't have to go to Florida, don't go. Mm -hmm. What he has done to Disney, 
has is, is atrocious in his way to attack the LGBT community. What he is doing is using the bully pulpit of the governor's office to promote a personal interest in becoming president by appealing to the lowest common denominator. And we cannot stand for that as both undemocratic and un-American. So, Derek, I wonder from your perspective, what would need to happen in the state of Florida for the NAACP to pull back its travel advisory? Well, we are clear this happened as a result of an election. Uh, this probably will be in place because you have a number of policymakers who make up the legislative body who agree with Governor DeSantis. So we're going to be preparing now for the next election cycle. That is the reality of our democracy. You settle differences at the ballot box. And between the, the election cycle, if there are policies that can be harmful or cause harm, we must address by any means we can. And this is one of the means we're saying to travelers to the state of Florida who happen to be African-American, LGBTQ women, uh, traveler beware, because this state, this leadership is hostile to our interests, to our existence. NAACP President and CEO Derek Johnson, always appreciate when you join us here at CBS. Thank you. Thank you. Well, the U.S. dollar has typically been the currency of choice when different nations want to trade with each other. But some countries have been shifting away from tying their currency to our dollar. Last month, Argentina announced that they would start paying for imports using the Chinese yuan due to their shortage of dollars. And Brazil followed suit announcing that it will allow companies to trade in yuan as well. Here with more on the currency shift is Carla Mosey. She is a senior markets reporter for Insider, Carla, welcome. Is there any reason to believe the yuan could actually overtake the U.S. dollar at this point? Well, there's been a lot of, thank you for having me. Um, there has been a lot of talk recently about uh, de-dollarization, uh, the yuan overtaking uh, king dollar in foreign, uh, foreign reserves, uh, global trade. Um, and the and China has been able to increasingly use its uh, yuan to purchase and uh, buy, you know, uh, buy and sell goods, um, but it still probably has a little bit of ways to go. Um, I was looking at some numbers here. The Bank of International Settlements said that uh, the U.S. accounts for about eighty eight percent of global trade. Uh, and that really hasn't changed over the past two decades. So it's going to take a while for, you know, any movement, uh, increasing movement, uh, significant movement for the yuan to overtake uh, overtake the dollar. But there's been a lot of noise around it uh, in, I think, recent months. Uh, Carla, there, this, the currency being tied by these nations to China's currency, the yuan, comes at a time when China is also working increasingly on, um, on international aid packages to uh, the global south, to in, enforcing greater relationships with other countries. Is there more at play than just it's easier to trade in the dollar or the yuan? Is this part of an international strategy on China's part? Uh, it is. China has been working for about, it's about, we believe, 2009 uh, to increase its, uh, you know, the, the yuan's usage uh, in international trade and also to, you know, reduce its dependence uh, on the dollar. Um, so this has been a, this has been a, you know, long-term view uh, mm -hmm. of China. Um, one of the things that you had, you, we should talk a little about is, why we're hearing a lot, a lot of noise about this is, you know, Russia. Uh, of course, Russia has been increasingly relying on China uh, to raise money for its economy after it was hit with sanctions for launching war against Ukraine. It's been buying billions of dollars of won um, and, you know, selling, uh, increasing uh, sales, oil sales uh, to China. Um, so, this is part of a of a larger theme for China. Um, it also has a Belt and Road uh, Initiative as well. Um, so, a couple of the countries that it just made deals with Laos and Kazakhstan, uh, Kazakhstan, uh, you know, they're part of that initiative. So there is a larger uh, there there are larger issues at play for for China 
uh, what it wants to do for its domestic economy and also how it wants to expand internationally. Mm -hmm. It's really interesting, Carla, to hear you talk about Russia, especially obviously given the situation in Ukraine and we see no end in sight, at least not in the near term. I'm wondering, though, if more nations start using the yuan for international transactions, what would be the potential ramifications for the U.S.? Well, I think the for the U.S., it you know it would it would probably it, you know hit hit the economy in in some ways. Although I was speaking with a, a currency analyst today, and he was saying uh, that sort of pace would be glacial when you're talking mm. about how entrenched the dollar is in terms of the global economy. So many of the com commodities contracts are priced in dollars. Mm. So that's those sort of movements. Uh, would probably be slow. Um, having said that, there are also people who are looking at, um, you know, how can we align ourselves more with China as China grows, uh, China's economy grows over, you know, the, the next few years, uh, over the next few decades. How can we align ourselves with this growing powerhouse? Uh -huh. um, and also, I think there are countries that are looking at what happened with the sanctions and saying, what if we cross lines with the U.S., with, you know, the EU, how will sanctions cripple our economies? And so there might be countries that are thinking maybe it's good to shift away from our, do our, our dependence on the dollar. It's really interesting, Carla, uh, that question about how the U.S. should be positioning itself, not only um, politically in, uh, in this global standoff with China, but also financially. Carla Mosey, thank you. Thank you. We're going to take a short break. Stay with us. You're streaming CBS News, always on. Bats have been linked to several deadly disease outbreaks, and the more people encroach on their habitats, the more likely those diseases are to spread to humans. Reuters launched an in-depth investigation into the hot zones, where bat-to-human transmission of illnesses are on the rise. One of their reporters joined the stream earlier today. I don't want to malign bats because... Yeah, I know. And I felt that we were sort of doing that in our teases, right? right? Because, the, because the truth of the matter is the reason that we are physically closer to bats is because we are helping to destroy their environment, either Thank sort you. of physically or because of climate change. That's but exactly that's what right. we're getting into. Bats are yeah. an incredible uh, species uh, that, uh, you know, serve their use in nature, but Emory is right. We are deforesting the planet at a high rate. So explain to our audience what regions are considered to be highest risk for bat-borne diseases that transmit to humans as we continue to encroach on their habitat. Hi, uh, well, my colleagues and I found that this is fundamentally uh, a story about the battle between the global economic system and nature, and the global economic system is winning. And in doing so, by our calculations, more than 1 billion people are at risk. And in our reporting, we focused on several areas. One of those was West Africa, where my colleague Helen Reed visited Ghana and Liberia, where mining for gold and iron ore and other metals is helping drive tree loss and put us into closer proximity with bats. Um, we, my colleague Deb Nilsson visited Kerala in Southwest India, where a deadly disease called Nipah has emerged for the first time. And then, of course, there's Southeast Asia, including Shishuangbana in China and, and Laos, where scientists have found closest, the closest links to SARS-CoV-2. And in South America, we visited the Amazon, where massive deforestation is to make room for things like livestock production has created more high-risk areas than anywhere else in the world. And, and scientists fear about that region, what we don't know, and that the next pandemic could emerge there. So I'm not a biologist, so you can, it's, anyone can correct me if I'm wrong. But I think you know part of part of the concern is that bats are mammals, mm -hmm. and so as a, just like we are, mm -hmm. and so as a result, um, there are viruses that can more easily uh, be transmitted to us because. Uh, they're, they're mammals, but also they're flying mammals. So they can move into vaster areas uh, in a way that other mammals may not be able to. Um, how have conditions in these high risk areas though, changed over the years to increase the chances of diseases being transmitted to humans? Because you know most of us don't really encounter bats to the point where they could transmit a disease to us. 
Well, you know, a couple of examples in, in Kerala, um, you could point toward development. Um, it's a tropical area where extensive tree loss and rapid urbanization has created, you know, sort of ideal conditions. And my colleague Deb Nelson visited the home of Muhammad Sabith, who contracted NEPA in 2018. And when you look at the satellite imagery around where he lived, you can see the changes over time, you know, that this is this sort of um, forested area where over the last two decades, you know, homes have started to emerge and you see little chunks of trees go missing, this habitat disruption that we talk about, um, you know, to, to make room for quarries or, or to make room for um, uh, fruit trees. Um, it, over in the Amazon, you know, under far right, far right populist president Yair Bolsonaro, um, you know, tree loss across the Amazon skyrocketed. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so and, and and that was a matter of public policy. So, you know, those are two two key reasons, the two key places where you can s sort of point to some, to yeah. some recent changes. Yeah, and and to that point, I mean, we're talking about the threat that bat poses to humans in terms of disease, but in fact, bat population around the world is declining for the very reasons that you mentioned, uh, which means it puts this very delicate delicate ecosystem at risk, particularly, for example, in the Amazon, where bats are responsible for pest control, mm -hmm. they actually spread pollen. Mm -hmm. uh, the, 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 there's it, removing bats from the equation could throw off the it's ecosystem. It's not good for us either. No, exactly. Mm -hmm. So so the, the the question then becomes, what regions are expected to become hot zones for bat to human disease uh, as, and what can governments do? I think ultimately at the end of the day, if, if governments decide that there are parts of their habitat and region that should not be encroached on, we can do away with this issue. But it's lacks government control, allowing people to move into these areas where these bats are naturally occurring. Well, let me give you an example. I mean, this doesn't mean that we have to stop development, but if you take Laos, for example, um, it's one of the most forested countries on earth. And there's been over the last two decades, there's been massive tree growth. Um, we focused on the Northern part of the country where trees have been felled to make sort of way for rubber plantations and other agricultural products destined for China. Now, just here recently, uh, a new high-speed rail line, the first one in Laos, um, which was built and financed by China, has opened, and its job is to speed goods and people um, to and from China. And um, and and so you could kind of point to that as an example and say, you know, scientists, you know, in many countries we have to, uh, many countries require projects, large projects, to have. Um, environmental impact assessments. And so scientists say, um, you know, on an, an, an example like this train line, if you were to do, uh, you know, the equivalent for biological risk, for viral risk, you know, you can you can make adaptations. You can under, if you understand the risk before the project is built, you can mitigate some of those, those risks by, you know, making different planning decisions. So it's not about stopping development at all. Um, it, it, it's about understanding the risk and, and taking steps to mm. to alleviate those. Right. And the other thing, honestly, is you know, honest, we're we're just scratching the surface yeah. on yeah. what we know about bats and their role in viral transmission, and you know, a lot of money and funding is needed for scientific research, right. um, yeah. for surveillance for, um, you know, various um, understanding bat behavior, why they do the things that they do. Yeah. Right. yeah. Uh, Ryan. Uh, so you I mean, might say that's expensive, but how expensive was COVID? Uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yes. Uh, the, it's expensive, but the cost is too high, if right. you will. Uh, Ryan McNeil, thank you very much. Coming up, it's America Decides. President Biden and Speaker McCarthy are meeting at the White House about the debt ceiling, how the two sides are negotiating before time runs out. And South Carolina Senator Tim Scott is running for president, how he plans to win the Republican nomination. America Decides is next. You're streaming CBS News.